please join me in welcoming Professor Simon Tavare to the lectern. So um, I think I might be saying anything, but I'll try not to. It's meant to be more organized. So thank you very much, Karen, for those kind words. Uh, it's a pity you have to listen to the next 50 minutes. Anyway, um, so what I'm going to try and say a little bit about are aspects of cancer research. And I thought I'd start by just pointing out where we do this in Cambridge. So Cancer Research UK is the world's biggest fundraising charity in the cancer space. It, makes, it, it brings in 13 million donations a year, uh, to totaling about 650 million pounds. And they spend about 400 million on research. And five of these buildings, like this one, are dotted around England and Scotland. And we're, we focus on rather different things. The big one is the so-called Crick Institute, which is a mixture of all sorts of other things. But in this particular one, we have about 500 people. And we range from mathematicians, physicists, chemists, all the way through to cancer doctors and surgeons. And um, so it's a, a lively environment. Right next door to it is going the headquarters of AstraZeneca, which is one of the big pharma companies, um, 2,000 of them in an 850,000 square foot building. And yesterday they nicked the head of my genomics operation. So that's how it works. <laughs> We have a no-compete clause. I'm not quite sure how that worked. Anyway, um, so that's where we are, and um, I'm going to say a little bit about how I tried to decide what this talk was about. So this is a little awkward because you never quite know who the audience is, and so I wasn't sure how to pitch things. So I thought a little bit about it and decided you're going to get a very personal view of things that I found interesting in this cancer world. So that's as important as it gets, as it were. Um, so what I'm going to say a little bit about uh, is the cancer by the numbers, so the cancer statistics, a little bit about how it's a dis thought of as a disease of the genome, and then my focus is really going to be on two aspects, a little bit on intertumor heterogeneity, that is looking at what the molecular biology of tumors looks like among many different tumors of the nominally the same type. And then I'm going to focus on the evolution bit, which is really about intratumor heterogeneity, what a single tumor looks like, like mine, for example. And I'll say a little bit about a couple of examples of this. One is glioblastoma, which is one of CIUK's so-called cancers of unmet need. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is more of a quantitative aspect of inference from sequencing data, trying to understand how tumors evolve. And then at the end, I'm going to say a little bit about newer technologies and give just a couple of little movies about a project we've just started on trying to represent breast cancers in three and a half dimensions. So more of that end of it. So let's see if I can get this to get a nice green pointer here the other day. Oh, okay, I'll try this red one. So I um, thought I'd just point out the scale of the problem. So Cancer Research UK and the International Agency of Research on Cancer have a lot of very interesting information about incidence and death rates from different cancer types. The latest figures I could find were almost five years old. So in 2012, the estimate, and it's pretty rough, of the number of new cases of cancer around the world is about 14 million, and the number of deaths from cancer is about 8 million. Um, to get a view of these statistics, you might want to look at their information. They have a fantastic website, which is very interactive, which allows you to scan through information about many different cancer types. Um, the Australian version of this is, this is the in-brief version of cancer in Australia. And so, for example, in England, there are about 360,000 uh, new cases a year. In Australia, 134,000. It's essentially proportional to the relative sizes of the populations. Uh, number of deaths is 160 odd thousand in England and about 50,000 in Australia. So it's a, you know, obviously a prevalent problem. An interesting thing to point out though, before we go much further, is the prevention part. And here, Australia and England, and in particular with CIUK support, have one very interesting feature, which is about um, anonymizing cigarette packets. 
which you did first, I think, by a good while. A good while. It, CIUK was involved in the effort in England for about five years, trying to persuade the government in the face of amazing <coughs> vociferous arguments from the tobacco industry that this should not be done. Uh, about a year ago, we now have unbranded cigarette boxes. And there, CIUK's estimate is about 40% of cancers are preventable in the sense that they are things related to obesity, smoking, drinking. By the way, there are drinks afterwards. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure there's any smoking afterwards. Anyway, so th this is just to give a feel for the sort of scale of the problems. And of course, it's sort of a truism of the cancer business that everybody knows somebody who has it or has had it. So why is it thought of as a disease of the genome? So my little schematic here, it, at the top is a, a picture of normal cell division. Um, typically when cells divide, they produce two cell offspring. If these cells end up with damage, for example from particular mutations, then there are methods that the cells have of cleaning up the bad ones. They kill them, basically. This is apoptosis. In the cancer world, things are a bit different, and I'm going to illustrate this in several ways as we go through tonight. Uh, here, what happens is that the, the control mechanism which tries to remove bad cells either doesn't work, or the rate at which these odd ones survive increases a lot, and what you end up with is uncontrolled cell growth, effectively. So we're going to be looking at the, the process of this uncontrolled cell growth. So to give you a feel for what happens, you may all remember what a typical carrier type looks like. This is a chromosome spread, and what you see are the familiar pairs of chromosomes. For example, in the top left-hand corner, chromosome 1, you get one copy from mum and one from dad, and they come in these sort of lovely pairs. This particular person's a male because they have an X and a Y at the bottom. So this is a, a typical picture of a, gene, of a, as it were, ordinary genome. For your amusement, you might like to know what a breast cancer genome can look like. This. So this is a, the same technology used to do this, but what you see are fragments of, for example, chromosome 1. If you look for the yellow bits across this genome at the bottom, you'll see them attached to all sorts of pieces of many other chromosomes. So there's this horrendous um, rearrangement and copy number variation that is typical of many tumor types. Not all, but many. <coughs> so for example, this one has what looks like five copies of this, this chromosome. I can't read the number from this distance, but 20 something, um, and so on. And then some of them are missing. So we face this problem all the time. It makes this field a bit different from the typical one of looking at ordinary germline DNA, which is typified by the pictures at the top. And as you'll see, this is, makes things hard. So what's the aim of the exercise? Well, the modern version of cancer research focuses on many different molecular technologies. I've listed one or two here. For example, we're going to focus quite a lot on mutations that arise in the tumor itself rather than in the germline. But we also might be interested in predisposition to cancer. For example, you might have a BRCA1 mutation or something like that. Um, we add in environmental information, other genetic modifications. All of these are measured by molecular technologies. I'm going to talk about just one in any detail. That's DNA sequencing. And we then look at um, trying to understand how all these molecular measurements tell us something about how the tumor evolved and how we might use it to predict outcome. And the typical pictures you see in lots of cancer papers are these little survival curves in which uh, particular types, particular groupings of mutations lead to very different types of survival rates. So that's the scheme, and pretty much everyone is doing something like this um, with a long-term aim, um, at least with our friends AstraZeneca around the corner, of trying to identify drug targets, for example. So I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned a little bit, two aspects of this problem, really. So we can think of tumor heterogeneity, that is variation among tumors, at many different levels. In this left-hand part, we're looking at interpatient variation. 
So here we might, this is more of sort of epidemiological scale problems, and I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. So we're looking at how the collection of, for example, breast tumors vary among a population of individuals. Uh, we might also be interested in how that variation looks within a given individual. And this is the one where the sort of evolutionary stories come into play. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about this spatial part, that is intratumor tissue variability, and what we're trying to do about that. That's the little piece at the end of what I'm going to say. And most of what I'll talk about is the genetic or DNA aberrations relating to what happens within a given tumour. So let's have a look at a couple of features of this. So our first foray into this on any scale is a, a paper we wrote about five years ago with a huge list of characters. Most of these projects are international and very big collaborations. Uh, this one has about 100 people involved in different aspects of it. And the idea was to look at the genome and transcriptome, expression levels of genes in a collection of breast tumors. And the, the motivation for doing this was to try to understand how breast tumors might be classified with a view to using that classification to understand how you might treat different groups in the, in the classification. And this we were able to do, at least make a start on it, and it appeared in this paper. Originally, <coughs> it was called the Genomic and Transcriptomic Architecture of a Thousand Breast Tumors. And then the journal, being typical, had a reviewer who said, there's not enough there, you can't learn anything from a thousand. So we whipped the other thousand out of our back pocket because we had them already lined up <coughs> and changed the title. And anyway, eventually it ended up being published. This, this paper has had quite an influence on the breast cancer world because it has given us a way of looking at different types of molecular classification. There are essentially 10 different versions of breast cancer, determined by, in this case, what are called microarrays. So this is older technology. Um, and in fact, since that time, the, the experimentalists, in particular, Carlos Caldas, who is the breast uh, oncologist in this project, um, has done an awful lot of follow-up with other sorts of technology and many other sorts of technology to try and understand more about what each of these different classifications does. So it's a beginning, this was the beginning of, in a sense, personalized medicine on the right scale. Um, things changed pretty quickly thereafter because what we can now do is sequence DNA. It's one of these remarkable, I should say, most of this field is driven by technology. So medics in the cancer space are extremely quick to take up new technologies, in part because usually they're reasonably well funded, and in particular for DNA sequencing, the way this works has been dramatic. So the first, the human genome was originally published in about 2001, and it was estimated to have cost $100 million for one genome. That's 3.3, roughly, billion letters of DNA that they sequenced. And then the technology sort of plodded along, being able to sequence for a little bit cheaper for a few years, until 2007, when one of the people who is now in my institute, Shankar Balasubramanian, and his um, partner, Dave Kleneman, um, worked on a new technology for doing DNA sequencing. And the effect of this has been dramatic. So they started a spin-out company in 2007. It was bought by Illumina, which is now worth about $3 billion a year. So it's quite a big sequencing company. And the costs have fallen dramatically. It, it now makes the ability to identify mutations of various sorts and other related DNA-type experiments very cheap. We're essentially at $1,000 a genome instead of the $100 million in about, what, 15 years or so. And in fact, now there are technologies which are going to be even cheaper and much more fun to use, but they're not quite ready for prime time yet. So this change in technology has had dramatic effects. And these DNA sequencing machines are now commonly put in labs. We have lots of them in our building. And they vary in size from these monstrous things like the PacBio machine here to very small ones. This thing, which is the size of a USB stick, uh, will sequence a human genome for not very much money. 
a bit more than a thousand dollars, but the scale of it is makes it usable in the field. It's an extraordinary trick. It's called a min iron, and this is the latest version of a min iron machine. Um, the, this is the Shankar's operation, the Illumina machines, and these allow us to do sequencing of many different types relatively cheaply. Of course, the drawback of running an institute is that you never have enough money and everyone else wants what you've got. So it's part of the game. So why are there, so what's the aim of the exercise? Well, what we're going to try and do, I, I'm not sure how easy this is going to be. Just, oh yeah, it might work. So the way this works in practice is that we try to collect tumor samples as well as a normal sample. So if, for example, we're looking at a prostate tumor, we might take a blood sample and a piece of the prostate or a piece of prostate near the tumor site. And that gives us so-called normal and tumor DNA. In practice, things are a lot more complicated because they're all muddled up, but let's just keep it simple for now. And then the aim of the exercise is to try to identify the mutations in the normal so that we would then be able to work out which are the mutations that are from the tumor rather than in the normal. So we're interested in the so-called somatic mutations in the tumor. And this gives an example of three different types of mutations the pink columns. Um, so, for example, if you look at the leftmost of them, the this regular uh, in the reference sequence, which is typically a version of the one that was found in 2001 or so, updated a bit, uh, was a C at this position. Uh, in this particular sample, we've ended up with A's and C's. So the normal individual has an A and a C. In the tumor, we see the same thing, an A and a C. So in this case, it doesn't help us work out which is a mutation that's inside the tumor, in the unique to the tumor, rather than in the normal. This column, I think we can say something about. In the normal, it's a C. And In the tumor, it looks as though it's a C and a T. So the T is unique to the tumor. And in this case, everybody is identical. They are the same thing. So the technology, the, the exercise, is to identify among these many, many samples, several thousand, normals and tumors, where the mutations are that are common to the um, germline and where the mutations are that are common to the tumor. And then most of the work is done on the tumor mutations. Now I've mentioned here just changes in single positions in the DNA. There are many other sorts which are also recorded. And in fact, it involves quite a lot of, not quite a lot, an enormous amount of computation to do. So we work on a number of these projects. Um, one of them is directed by the so-called ICGC project, the International Cancer Genome Consortium. This started about six years ago, and its aim was to systematically identify for 50 tumor types, 500 matched pairs of samples, so 500 normals and 500 tumors to go in the, in the same individual, and to use that information to try to understand something about the molecular variability in that tumor type. So England has been involved in this project in a big way, and there's a corresponding version in uh, America called the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. The particular ones we work on in Cambridge in the Institute are esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is another one of Cancer Research UK's tumors of unmet need. It's one of the aggressive ones, and I'll show you a little bit about it in a minute. And we also work on prostate. Um, so we have a quite big groups that work on these two. And so what we've done is to sequence, for the esophageal ones, actually thousands of them now, rather than just 500. And we're trying to understand a number of things about these tumors. So esophageal cancer is a very interesting one. It is the tumor type that's increasing in frequency in the West faster than any other cancer type. It has the awkward property that it's hard to diagnose. It's 
when it's identified, it's usually too late, and it doesn't have a very good survival rate. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment to try to identify people who might be at risk for this in so, with so-called early detection techniques. And the person who leads this project, um, we do the computational side, and the leader of it is Rebecca Fitzgerald, who's a gastric doctor. And she has done all sorts of interesting things about trying to do early detection. She, for example, has this lovely thing which you swallow, it's a little tube, a little um, pill in a plastic container, and you swallow it, and then the pill surface breaks up, and you pull the thing out again. I got the postdocs to do this. That's one of the advantages of being the boss. And I didn't do it. Anyway, what it does is to, you then pull this little sponge out, and you get about a million cells all the way up your esophagus, which you can then do DNA sequencing and many other things with. And the idea there is to try to find a way of identifying the key mutations which might tell you, ah, you are at risk of this particular disease. So it varies in uh, frequency across the world in many different ways. Uh, there are, I should say, two types. This is one particular one, the esophageal adenocarcinomas. So um, lots of people have been involved in this. It turns out that not very much interesting happens in the DNA of these in the sense that there's no easy way to classify the mutations you see in these tumors to mimic the sort of thing we did with the <coughs> breast cancer project I alluded to. So what we find is that about 75% of patients have a particular mutation in this gene P53. About 12% of cases have a mutation in another gene called P16. And as you'll see in a second, the rest of them are all over the map. There's nothing coherent that we can see in these at all. And what is worse, remember I put up that little picture of the variation in copy number or the way that the chromosomes have been smashed into bits and rearranged in all sorts of strange ways. The copy number profiles of these are dramatically different. And this seems to be a disease that's driven by copy number variation rather than these single point mutations that I've been talking about. So we've worked a lot on this. Um, we've got a few publications now that tell us a bit more than we knew before. So the idea here is not to look at the details of this picture. It's to note that so individuals in the sample, this particular one is 129 patients, are across the top, across the columns. And what's shown in the down each column are the mutations that that individual has, classified in many different ways. And I think if you stare at this, it's pretty hard to see anything very systematic, except maybe the top line, which is this P53 mutation, where roughly 75% of people have it, and so on. So systematically, it's not been easy in this disease to find um, ways of classifying patients. We've um, more recently been trying to do, use the information in copy number and mutations to make so-called signatures, which might help us make uh, an assessment of different subgroups which might be therapeutically treatable in various different ways. And we've also looked quite a lot at what happens with pre- and post-chemotherapy. So most patients we get, get adjuvant chemotherapy straight away. And that messes up your genome, potentially. So the question we had to face is, can you collect samples for one of these huge projects by using people who have had already chemotherapy. And in this particular disease, it seems to be okay. The changes are not dramatic, at least when we get them. Okay, so those are two examples of variation among individuals in a large population <coughs> cohort. The hard part in all this is not actually the computational biology, really. It's getting the samples. And there's a big group behind this project. Um, 15 different hospitals who contribute cases. So now I want to talk about the other end of the picture, which is to look within a given tumour. So let me just remind you a little bit about evolutionary biology. Um, one of the very earliest things in the early 1920s was using a particular sort of marker um, to identify relatedness among individuals. And this has been used in now in many different ways. The picture on the left is about trying to understand how primates are related to each other. 
Uh, the picture on the bottom right is an 1850s schematic of how those relationships look. And what you may notice, the oddities in this are that well, man is always at the top, that's just life. Um, it's, you know, Oxford's down here, Cambridge's up here, that's how it works. <laughs> and then, the, this, in this thing, it looks as though uh, gorilla is the closest related to man, orang is next, and so on. We would now have a different picture of this, but the idea is the same. It's to use comparisons of DNA information of various types to distinguish the phylogenetic relationships among, in this case, primates. The little thing at the top is one of Darwin's notebooks. So Darwin was a... Uh, I'm in the same college as he was in. Uh, he hated the place, apparently. Um, and this is one of the first pictures of a schematic for how a group of species evolved. So, of course, the idea is to do similar sorts of things, this time not with um, primates or humans, but with cells. So that's where we're headed. And what we're going to try and do is mimic something like what is done commonly in the DNA world for humans, that is reconstructing the history of migrations of things, in this case, humans, uh, I'm going to do the same thing, but with cells. And we, so we use that to try and understand something about the evolution of one of these tumors in a given individual. So how does this work? Well, we're just going to sort of mimic the same scheme here. So we're going to look at inferring aspects of how a tumor evolves rather than a population of primates. Uh, how does the variation look? How, is it, how are those mutations distributed across a tumour. What does that tell you about the history of the tumour? That's the analogue of the slide I just showed about spatial orientation. How old is a tumour? In some cases we know when tumours are formed because they have, have to have particular mutations that get them going. We might look at the cancer stem cell question. Something that's quite popular now is to look at subclones and their frequencies, and I'm going to draw a picture of this in a second. And we, what I'll show at the end, if we have time, is a little bit about evidence of selection. So can you tell which particular mutations uh, are driving the growth of the tumour and where they're coming from? So I think the easiest way to think about this is to just show these two pictures, which come from Andrea Sotoriva's uh, Nature Genetics paper. There are many versions of this uh, around, but I'll point out just these two. So... The, the way in which these clones are expected to work is something like the following. So over here at time zero, when the tumour starts growing in, let's say, a single cell, the mutations accumulate in what are called clones or subclones. And every now and again, a new tumour type arises from a particular group of mutations, here indicated by the little sharp bit at the bottom of the yellow uh, group. And these the same process goes on for a while with these subclones growing in frequency. Uh, and so if, for example, you looked, as we do, at a particular time here, what we're effectively doing is sampling cells from these different clones. They have different molecular architectures. There's uh, quite a lot of controversy about, actually, if that's really the picture. And one interesting version of this, which... Um, we might say a bit more about later on, is what is called the Bing, Big Bang model, which is essentially that most of these mutations occur very, very early on in the history of the tumour, so that the clonal picture looks very different than the one on the left. So one thing that we're going to try and do, if we have time at the end of today, is to try and work out for a given set of tumours, are they more consistent with this sort of evolution or this one, and things like that. So that's what clonal evolution is all about. Um, now, why does it matter? Well, there's a point to this. The idea of chemotherapy is to wipe out the tumour clones. Now, most chemotherapy agents, for example, temozolomide in brain cancers, is not a very nice thing to have done to you. It wipes out all sorts of things. But what is observed is that the tumours come back. Almost all tumours recur in any type. So the reason this happens, or one reason it's thought to happen, is that the um, chemotherapy agent, for example, might wipe out this blue one, but then another clone is going to take over and avoid the chemotherapy agent, and so the tumour recurs. So that's why we're trying to understand a little bit about how they're organised. So um, 
So the ingredients of this are quantitative. So what we're trying to observe is, for example, the history, things about the history of the tumor. The way we're doing it is by measuring things about the tumor, for example, mutations and copy numbers. Uh, and then we try and connect the thing we can't see to the thing we can see and use the, that data that we've generated to, make, to fit a particular mechanistic model to these data and to try and understand the structure of it, of the, how the tumor evolved. And this has led to a number of um, computational methods, which I'm going to allude to very briefly later on, uh, in particular uh, inference methods that involve Bayesian statistics of some sort. Um, and what we're going to do is try and learn the parameters of a model using that sort of approach. So I'll give a little more detail in a bit. So I'm going to give first an example, and I, I put this one up only because this project started um, in 2010, I think, with a chance meeting of the two Italian-looking names on that list, namely this one and this one, postdoc of Colin Watts, who's a brain surgeon, a PhD student of mine, and we got involved in trying to understand what Colin's tumor operations were doing. He's a glioblastoma surgeon primarily, and he had a very clever idea for how to sample these tumors. I'll show you that in a second. At the time this was done, we were all in the same group, but now, as you'll notice, everyone's gone every which way. Um, for example, Andrea Sotoriva just got tenure at the ICI yesterday, Christina Curtis is at Stanford, and so on. So the, this is the typical academic thing, of course. Um, your superstars do useful things and then disappear too soon. I'll show you a bit more of what they did later. So um, Colin's idea was to try to use a particular marker which labeled the tumor cells. So when he looks down the microscope to do the surgery, I didn't have the courage to go and watch it, but the others in the group did. They actually helped get the samples. Uh, the tumor cells fluoresce, so you can see where they are better than if you hadn't done this labeling technique. And that allows him to, when he's resecting the tumor mass, to take samples from strategically placed bits of the tumor, typically within more than half a centimeter apart. And so it's a way of looking at different, you might think of each one as a little biopsy. So with this in mind, what you collect are data from spatially organized bits of the tumor, a theme we're going to come back to time and time, and time again. And what we're interested in doing is trying to understand the evolution of the tumor from the information we get from these little pieces. Um, so one of the things that you try and do is to organize the mutations by their frequencies. How often do they occur in the samples? Um, this was done on only 11 patients with about six pieces from each patient. And what you see are particular sorts of mutations that occur, appear to occur early because they're very common. For example, EGFR, this mutation in EGFR up here. Others are shared between some of the pieces and not others. Uh, for example, P10. And then there are unique ones which appear in only one of the little pieces rather than more than one. And this gives you a very crude way of trying to organize the um, timing of events that have led to the evolution of this particular tumor type. And studies like this are now pretty common in varying levels of details. We also did the same sort of thing with a so-called microarray experiment to understand something about the transcriptional picture that's going on here. So there are two essential pictures in this, two, the two lines of colors. The top line, uh, any... Sorry, what happened? Ah. Uh, for example, what you're doing is clustering the samples together. And what has occurred in this is that colors, uh, individuals of the same color come from the same tumor. So in this case, the orange ones all clustered together, so they look much more similar to each other than to any other tumor. Um, and that's pretty much true across all of the types. All of the 11 are roughly sorted out like that. The nasty part is the one at the bottom, which um, is a way in which the surgeons try and classify the behavior of the tumor so they can know what, something about how to treat it. And what they do is to use a collection of these measurements to call the nature of the tumor, one of these four types. 
And so what I've shown at the bottom is the call for each of the little pieces. And what you see, unfortunately, for example, in this individual, is that this one has uh, three different types within the same tumour. So the, the moral of the tale is that if you were deciding on treatment schedules using one of these little segments, which is the size of a typical biopsy, you get different calls within the same tumour. So this is just a canonical example of why uh, of what spatial heterogeneity is all about. Unfortunately, of course, we don't really have a way of fixing this problem because you can't keep doing multiple resections and so on. It's uh, not very helpful. It doesn't help treatment at all. So what you're now able to do is build a picture of how the tumours have evolved, uh, illustrated briefly here. I won't go through all the details, but suffice it to say we do it with many different types of measurement and we get a roughly consistent story about which clones were driven by which particular mutations and so on. So there's one simple example. Um, what I'm going to say a little bit next uh, about now is how you might try and understand this not from array data but from bulk sequencing data. So what do I mean by bulk sequencing? Unlike typical ordinary genomic, uh, or say rare disease studies, where you can sequence each individual separately. In this world, we don't. We actually take a pool of cells, do indescribable things to them, and sequence whatever we got. So we get a sequencing experiment that mixes up cells of different types. And as you saw in my little clonal picture, these cells have different mutational pictures. The aim of the exercise is to use this currently rather crude technology to infer something about that clonal heterogeneity. How, what do they look like? And I'm going to show um, a couple of examples of this. So um, here is a, a, a paper from a rather famous uh, publication in which they studied a version of this data set. It's been slightly cleaned up for the purposes of today. Uh, it involved finding roughly 28,000 mutations across the genome of a particular cell line. And what I've shown in the table is the number of mutations on each chromosome. And you'll notice, of course, that the, the variability in the numbers of them is astronomical. There's a couple of chromosomes with nothing, like chromosome 7 is missing. Uh, there are very few on some and many, many on other chromosomes. So this is the sort of data you get, counts of mutations. And what we'd like to do is infer things from that. And the way it's usually done is to draw a picture like this. So what the guys have done is to look at each mutation, each single position in the little diagram I had before, and ask what is the frequency or what is the estimate of the proportion of cells that have that particular new mutation in them. And so I've got 27,000 such measurements, frequencies of those things estimated from the sequencing, and here I've just binned them in a histogram. So I've divided the bins up into length, things of length 0.1, I guess. Yeah, 10 bins. And I've plotted how many mutations have frequencies in that each of those bins. Now, the idea of this is as follows. What you're effectively doing is clustering the mutations together by frequency. And the idea is that things which have common frequency, mutations with common frequencies, are like or similar frequencies are likely to be in the same cells. And what this would tell you is that there's maybe three clones in this picture. One around this one, one around this type of mutation, and one around this type. Now, uh, you can take that with any amount of pinches of salt you like. Um, that is the idea. And then the problem starts. So the question is, how does this work? So what, uh, what we do is to do this multiple sampling again. This particular example is a colorectal cancer. What we do is to take a, a little piece of the tumor and to extract from it little pieces of sample, like I did with the brain tumors, except these are, look rather, the little test tubes look rather like little crypts, which have about 10,000 cells in each one. And so we can collect information spatially around the tumor and we're going to try and use that information in the same way, not just with one sample that I alluded to from the little histogram, but with 
essentially a histogram for each little piece. Okay? And so what we'll hopefully end up with, what we're going to need... Oh, no, don't do that to me. There we go. What we're going to need somehow is a model for how the tumour is evolving. And what I'm showing you here is a simulation that's uh, ended up in one of these nice cancer textbooks uh, for what it's, it's a simulation of a 3D version of a tumour. And the clones are things of... So yellow things are the same clone, blue things are another clone, and so on. And what we're interested in doing is using this model to infer something about the clonal nature of the tumour. So the way it's done is a, a particular computational technique. Uh, it's called approximate Bayesian computation. It's a cheap and sort of... What's the, word? What's the way to say it? Uh, if you can't do anything else, this is what you might try, I guess, is the way to say it. It's designed to do inference for processes that are very complicated, like that little rotating tumour simulation I showed you. So the idea is sort of obvious. It's to simulate data from the prior distribution of the parameters, for example, the selective rates in the clones, the mutation rates for different clones, and so on. Uh, what, given that parameter, we simulate the tumour. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Like the revolving thing I had. Uh, measure the same things as you had measured in your own data set. And if you get close enough to the target, that is, you simulate something that looks quite like the real data, then that parameter is thought of as being a sensible thing to call a draw from the posterior, roughly. So there's now a literature about this problem that goes back a long way. Uh, there are thousands of papers written about this. But it has proved quite useful in this particular context because the models we have are spatially resolved 3D things, and they're quite difficult to do um, sort of more formal theoretical statistics with. Um, I think the only thing I need to say at the moment is that we're going to use this or a version of it to say something about how the tumour evolves. So I'm, I'm going to use an example which is not my work, it's work of Andrea you've heard about before and Christina you've heard about before, but this is really a chance to point out my magic collaborator, Daryl Shibata, who I've been working with for 25 years on these problems. He is magical. He's, got, he's one of the really original people in the work, cancer evolution world. And the three of them, and many others, led by Sun, who's a PhD student of Christina's, um, have worked a bit more on this problem. And I'm going to tell you their work, just very briefly. Now, I hope this works. So what they've done is to design a simulation method which simulates a three-dimensional tumour. Uh, I won't go into the details because we're running out of time. But the idea is to be able to simulate the 3D structure of a tumour, and then you mimic what you did in the sample. You know, remember I told you we take these little biopsies out in these crypts. We can do the same thing from the simulated tumour. We then mimic the DNA sequencing experiment because it's not directly... You, you mix up all the cells and then you sequence them, so you model all the sequencing experiment, and that gives you data that look like the thing which will become those little histograms. One histogram for each little sample you've taken. So the first, one of the questions you want to know is, of course, is it worth sampling more than one biopsy? Can you learn anything about the history of the tumour from just one? The guess would be no because we saw that in the brain tumour. But maybe with two you could do something, or six or whatever, so we'd like to find out about that. So what is shown in the very rightmost picture of this is one of those little histograms. Uh, there are two of them on the picture, one upside down from the other. So sample A, let's just look at sample A because I can't see things upside down. You lot can, of course. Um, so sample A is a histogram of the mutations you found in that little segment. The blue ones are ones which have appeared in just uh, a few segments, not universal. The grey ones are mutations that have occurred in all the little pieces, and so on. So it gives you a feel for the sort of nature of these little histograms that you see. And of course, since it's a simulation, we know how many clones there are because you've simulated the whole process. So you can try and infer what's happening from that. So that's what they do. And uh, I'll just say that they have simulated for a variety of different, this is like the ABC part, 
Um, they've simulated a variety of different models of the evolution of the tumor, which involve the rates at which different clones expand. And you can see the coloring there denotes clones which have frequencies bigger than some background amount, because one of the key problems here is that the sequencing experiment doesn't allow you to find the rare ones. They're difficult to find experimentally. So clones that don't occur with high frequency are very difficult to detect. So they're discounted from this, which is why there is a hole around zero in all of these X axes. So that, this is a, a sort of very quick and dirty schematic of what they do. And I'll just, sorry, wrong, wrong thing. I'll just point out some conclusions that they learned from this study. The papers in Nature Genetics that came out a couple of months ago, there have now been three or four others in the last week or so. So it's quite a popular area. So the first thing is that this so-called site frequency spectrum, the little histogram thing, can be used to distinguish between selection and neutrality or weak selection um, because the patterns of heterogeneity you get are different in these two cases and you can distinguish it by looking at the histograms. That allowed them to take a whole bunch of data, some of which they generated themselves, some of which they grew in mice and so on, um, of four different tissue types to understand they could how to classify each of the tumors in each of those four types as one of the different modes of uh, expansion, strong selection, weaker selection, no selection, and so on. And that's a way of, in principle, trying to identify where the drivers of the tumor are. Um, for example, in selected samples, the ones which grow differentially, you would expect to find driver mutations, the important ones, in one or two of the clones and not in other ones. So you can infer a lot about the history of the tumor using this quite simple method. So I'm going to end with, I think I've got five minutes left, which will just work perfectly. Um, I'm going to end with where this goes. So you may have noticed that I've mentioned uh, pooling cells together, because that's the technology of how you do sequencing at the moment, typically. Uh, and I've also, it's also the case that you don't actually measure single cells or spatially resolved cells. You don't know where they really come from. So this is something which lots of people are now working on, and not just in um, the cancer world. You may have heard in the talk this afternoon, if you were here, mention of the human cell atlas, which is an, an arrangement to try and understand the nature of most cells in a human, as it were. So the point here is that biology is four-dimensional, 3D and time, uh, but our technologies are typically, so far, in the cancer space, one or two-dimensional. DNA sequencing you think of as one-dimensional. But now, of course, we can do lots of other things. Uh, we can, for example, use much more clever microscopy technologies. I'll show you a picture in a minute, which allow you to look at live cell imaging and whole organism evolution through time. We can't do it with tumors because you, well, with solid tumors, you can't do it because it's just not allowed. Uh, the next thing that's happened is looking at single cell genomics, so sequencing single cells. And it, there are now technologies, so Sam Aparicio, who I'm going to show you in a second, has, a, has just sequenced his 150,000th single cell you know, from particular tumor types. Um, so he gets the resolution of every cell in the tumor that it, uh, to the scale he wants it. Um, there have also been these interesting um, ways of doing proteomics in three dimensions, in spatially resolved structures, using <coughs> imaging mass cytometry. And uh, what we're now trying to do, and I'm going to end with this little example, is to do this for tumors. We would like to get not just a one-dimensional picture of the tumor, but a genuine, annotated, three-dimensional version of a tumor, and in fact, a bit more if we could, like three and a half. In solid tumors, we don't get the time component very easily, so I'm not going to focus much on that. We can get a little bit of time, and I'll if I have time explain. So what do I mean by this? Well, the first thing I'm going to show you is a rather pretty picture of the evolution of gastrulation in a zebrafish. So this was done by Gopi Shah, who is in our core facility, one of the few who hasn't been robbed by AstraZeneca yet. And she built this little device herself uh, while she was a PhD student in Germany. 
And what I'm going to show you is an image taken over, starting at four hours to 18 hours. So it's 14 hours of imaging. And what you'll see with a bit of luck... Oh, come on, don't do this to me. How do I do this? <coughs> ah. What you're going to watch is the body plan of the fish turn up. So if you watch this for a little bit, so colour denotes depth, so you can see 3D. Uh, the cells are labelled with colours, fluorophores, and now you, as you're watching this, you can see the um, gastrulation in the fish. It's getting, it's looking more and more like an embryo. But what's going on there is interesting. It's 3D. It's got a time component, of course. But what isn't known with this sort of experiment yet is what is inside each cell. So what's the nature of the DNA in each cell, which is what we need for a tumour. So we have worked on a, um, a particular competition. Cancer Research UK had a thing called the Grand Challenge, in which they asked groups around the world to compete for large amounts of money, 20 million quid each, to look at particular um, well, what they called grand challenge questions. And one of the major ones in this competition is how do you learn something about the nature of the cells in and around a tumour in situ in 3D? And eventually, after many, several years of work, we won this competition. And so what I'm just going to show you is the sort of things we're trying to do. Formally, it started in May. It goes for six years. The idea is to study breast tumours because we have... As I've alluded to, quite a lot of expertise in this area. And what we're doing is the following little trick. Well, maybe we are. Here we go. So what I'm going to show you is an example of what's called a serial two-photon two tomography experiment. So the idea is to take a little biopsy. That's a millimeter cube of a tumor. And what you're watching is the, the green thing is the microscope. That's imaging into the tumour sample, and then once it's imaged, it goes over to this little razor blade looking thing and chops the top 20 microns off the top, and the little piece falls into the water bath there, it's disappeared, but then the process starts again. It images in again, moves over to the little razor blade, chops the top off, so now you're imaging down a stack of cells in the tumour. A millimetre cubed is about 100,000 cells of the order of, and so what we're doing is collecting these little pieces with this Heath Robinson looking device. Right. So, of course, it's no good trying to learn what's inside each of those little slices, the molecular annotation of the cells, if they've fallen into the water bath and you scramble up the order, you don't know who's who. So in this device, you can see that the little pieces are collected in order. So here comes one. It's being collected from the bath. So this, this belt drive thing is collecting the little pieces. And then in each piece, we measure things about the cells. So the imaging part tells you where the cells are in 3D. Each little slice is then measured in a number of different technologies. Uh, we're using a technique called Murfish to understand something about the, for example, the um, mRNA concentrations or numbers in each cell. And the aim of the exercise is to end up with, of the order of 25,000 measurements in each cell, which would be spatially resolved within each cell. It's subcellular resolution. At the moment, we can do about 1,000 measurements. Um, and we can do different technologies on each of the different slices. So you can see there's a nice statistics problem coming here, how you try and put all this back together again which is why a group of us are involved in it. And, for example, we might do proteomic measurements on one of the slices. That's using that IMC thing I mentioned. Or we might do, well, we're not going to try and do single-cell DNA sequencing in spatial resolution, but we could just dissociate all the cells in one of those slices and do single-cell, 150,000 cells or whatever, how many, however many you want, at whatever depth you want. So this is getting us our 3D image of the tumour, and then we interact with it by looking in some sort of virtual reality environment, which allows us to look through the tumour. 
and w the intention is to you this is sort of modern molecular pathology the idea is to make a little device that will do the experiment like a sequencing machine and with aim of the exercise is to do this in 4,000 breast tumors each one to that sort of scale of resolution and what you get oh, uh, this is the last slide I think what you get uh, is a, a virtual reality view which can be used by different oncologists who are in different countries looking at the same tumour. And so it's a little, I don't know if you've played with VR machines, but they're quite fun. So this is the tumour here, and we have a, a workbench where you can change the scale of the observations. Uh, you can do things which allow you to drag and drop and pick particular features of the tumour, and you'll see different cell types in here, the things of different shapes are different cell types, so it allows you to look at the microenvironment of the tumour and so on. So this is sort of a nice, uh, we have a game company, gaming company who does this with us, and it allows you to study this in some sort of nice interactive way. It also has, of course, a sort of flat file extraction thing, a work desk which grabs information. And now using this, we can tell how the cells are interacting, how many cell types there are, and so on. So that's where this game is headed. It's a bit more detailed than it used to be, not just smashing cells up and sequencing them all at once. There are 14 different groups involved in this, um, and they're listed here. The, sorry, can't find the right button. The head of it is Greg Hannon, who's the next director of the Institute. And I've mentioned Shankar before. Ben Bodenmiller is the person who did, invented the IMC technology. Joanna Joyce is now in Lausanne. She's the uh, microenvironment expert. Sam Aparicio does single cell sequencing and so on. So there's a, a, a big group of us. Xiaowei Zhang does the Murfish sequencing and Ed Boyden does expansion microscopy. These technologies are all, um, at the moment, each is doing different things in different layers, but the idea is eventually to pull it all together and try and get a systematic view of what solid tumors look like in 3D. So with that, I should end and just acknowledge and thank the um, people who invited me and supported the visit. So that's the School of Mathematics and Statistics, the VCCC, and Melbourne Integrative Genomics. And with that, we're five minutes away from a beer. Thank you very much for your time.